it's one of those scenes that has kind of contributed to the overall tone of the show and that we can kind of get away with these kind of fantastical moments. I meet so many people who, you know, they're literally like, The Wire is the most amazing show and I, I have not watched anything else that's like everything of that calibre. And you sort of think, well, you should be watching like the soaps as well because you need to get that kind of the structure and the idea of how to create characters sort of in your DNA. And so you have to watch everything, I think. Originally, I really wanted to direct. That was sort of my passion. Like I was really obsessed with films basically and making short films when I was in high school. And I applied for film school. I got in when I was um, quite young and it was more of a focused on directing. And I used to make a lot of like quite experimental films that didn't have any dialogue in them, which is uh, interesting now. And then something kind of shifted. I started watching a lot of um, like box sets. You know, I really got into The Sopranos, Sex and the City, um, Six Feet Under is absolutely huge show for me. And I think that was really the moment where I was like, oh, like you can tell these stories over, you know, like a really long stretch of time and it could almost be like a novel and you could get people to like really fall in love with these characters. And I think that was when it really shifted for me and I was like, oh, I think I really want to be a TV writer. And then um, I applied to do a screenwriting master's in the UK and I got onto that and that was really the start you know, taking the script writing, like, seriously. Eleven Film, um, there was a producer there who had um, watched a documentary on Channel 4 that was about teenagers talking about their sex lives with um, a therapist. And that had kind of made her go, oh, like, it would be quite interesting to have a sort of sex therapy teenage character. And then it was sent out to, like, lots of different writers. It sort of, it was... A, you know, about a page long. And it came to me. I was like very early on in my career and I read it. I could just instantly sort of see the world and I could see a way that we could take lots of teenage tropes and teenage kind of real stock characters and then find a way to sort of flip them and start a new conversation around them. And I pitched so hard and I sent photos of myself to the producers when I was a, like a nerdy teenager. And yeah, and they, they gave me the opportunity to kind of take that sort of seed and then develop it into a bigger world. And I really knew that I wanted to have this really intense relationship between a mother and a son, that kind of single parent, like very potent dynamic. I wanted that to be really at the core of the show. I've noticed you're pretending to masturbate and I was wondering if you wanted to talk about it. The pilot script of Sex Education got written um, quite a few years ago and we took it to lots of different channels um, in the UK and I think it just wasn't the right moment it wasn't the right time and people didn't really know what to do with it and I really thought that it had sort of died and I'd kind of grieved those characters I was like then they're, they're just going to stay on the page they're never going to you know become a tv show and then somebody at Netflix read it and it it came back to life um and it happened quite fast actually like once Netflix read it we really went straight into the writer's room like a few months sort of after that and then we're shooting not too long after that so it was just it was a bit of a roller coaster I think it's such a tricky question to answer, actually, because I think so often, like, the things that really land or really connect with people, maybe on paper, you wouldn't think that it would. I remember, like, early on in my career, I would go in and talk to producers and they would so often be saying, like, they were looking for the next, you know, like, the next Game of Thrones or the next Girls. Um, and then you'd sort of try and recreate your own version of something that had already been made. I always found, like, it, it just didn't, something wasn't quite right because it didn't feel truthful or like personal. So I think it, like a good idea has got some kind of authenticity to it and it feels sort of fresh and I think it's got to feel like the people that are writing it really love it and like you can feel their love for it and then it sort of, I think it translates onto the screen. I'll deal with the business and things and you can do the therapy. Therapy? Yeah, sex therapy. Like your mum. Wow, sex therapist. This could be awesome. I was obsessed with teen um, films and TV shows and also books. There's a Judy Bloom book called Forever, which was a very big deal for me when I was a teenager. And with sex education, it's taking inspiration from, I think, a lot of that stuff. You just like Dawson's Creek, Freaks and Geeks. Um, oh, Dawson's Creek. Um, the OC is a really big one for me as well. And then also films like 10 Things I Hate About You, some John Hughes, you know, Breakfast Club. See, so yeah, I think we're taking a lot of the kind of inspiration from it and then trying to kind of like update the conversation or sort of bring it into 2021. The writer's room that I work in, it's 
mostly female. Um, it's very queer. It's quite an open space. Like people really feel like they can take risks. We try not to be too like judgmental. I guess there's a kind of like a kindness to the room. And I think it's because of the people that are making that room up. And then I think it does then reflect in the storytelling and then like on the screen. I just think we, it, there needs to be more of that like across the whole TV industry. And it needs to be not just in rooms that are being led by women or LGBTQ um, writers or writers of color. I think we need to see white men <laughs> populating their room in a diverse way. Um, that's the only way that we're gonna really start to see changes. I think for me, the comedy has always been the most sort of important part of the show. I think it sort of allows us to talk about more serious themes, I guess. And, um, you know, and I think in some ways the show does have an agenda, like it's about trying to create a better conversation around sort of sex and relationships and um, consent, body positivity, all of that kind of stuff. Well, stop passively hearing and start actively listening. But I think we're allowed to do that because it's a comedy, so that people are also going to have a good time and it's entertaining and they're not going to feel like they're being preached to in any way. So when I'm writing, I'm always trying to think what's like the funny way into the storyline. And also like sweet, like what's going to make it feel kind of tender and very like teenage and cringeworthy. So yeah, comedy definitely comes first. We are going to have sex. <laughs> Can you calm down? Myself and my writing team, you know, we will have like a list of, I guess, sort of sex issues or problems or things that we think it would be really important to highlight. And then it's very much a kind of process of trying to work out who are the best characters to tell those stories with. It usually happens quite organically. Like it, it sort of will find its natural fit. I had like incredibly bad sex education as a teenager myself. I went to quite a lot of schools like I'm my mum moved around quite a lot when I was young so I went to a lot of different schools and it was just terrible everywhere I went Jesus and I think in retrospect it actually was quite damaging because I think it didn't give um, the young women and also like LGBTQ plus teenagers like any agency any kind of tools to talk about our own bodies or kind of understand our own connection with pleasure or desire. And the more I've sort of written the show and developed the show, I've realized that this was like a good opportunity to address that and sort of try and like right some of those wrongs. Um, but, you know, obviously tr to try and do it in an entertaining way. Oh. <laughs> I think I'm ready to, you know, really. Because I do think it's really important that um, young people can turn on a teen show and see themselves reflected. And in order to do that, I think you need a lot of characters, you need a lot of diversity, and you've got to just look at it from different perspectives. When you're white and cisgendered, it's just a given that you're gonna be able to watch a film or watch a TV show and you're gonna see something that you can connect to kind of reflected back at you. I think maybe we don't really understand how that shapes the way that we feel in the world. And I think it feels actually like a real tragedy that there's all these other people who make up, you know, a huge percentage of the world that we live in and they don't get to have that same experience. And I also think it's really important that people from LGBTQ um, communities, women, um, people of colour are also getting to tell their own stories and feeling empowered in that storytelling. <laughs> Why are you so angry? Because we've been friends since we were nine years old and you've abandoned me for someone that you've known for five seconds. What kind of man do you want to be? There is something to be said for having queer characters who are not completely defined by their queerness and making sure that they've got other things going on in their life, in their storylines. You know, they've got other emotional drives, you know, conflict with their parents or just a plain love story. I think that maybe helps it. Uh, the characters sort of become more universal rather than sort of boxed in. The rule that I have in the show with the sex scenes is there shouldn't be any sex scenes in the show that are not telling us something new about the characters or pushing the story forwards. And in terms of working with the intimacy coordinators, what's been incredible about that is that that's really their job on set is to translate the story into a sex scene. You know, if you think that when you watch a film that's got like a huge big fight sequence, it's telling a story. It's not just, you know, you're not just watching it just to see people kind of being 
hacked up or stabbed. And I think it, it should be the same with a sex scene. Um, and that's really what the intimacy coordinators do. Like they obviously also do like incredible work to make everybody feel safe and making sure that they're working with like skeleton crews and um, everything is completely choreographed so everyone knows what's being touched, when they're going to be touched, um, how they want to be touched. It just makes so much sense. And if we had fight coordinators for so long, why did we not have intimacy coordinators? Why do you like to be touched? <laughs> Above the waist. The writing team, we worked very closely with some disability consultants and then also with George Robinson, who plays Isaac himself. But I also think what's quite interesting with that scene is it obviously it's about sex and disability, but I think more than anything, it's actually about consent. It's really one of the scenes in our show that really shows like that you can have enthusiastic consent and it can still be, you know, like a fun, sexy thing. That is my vagina in the photo. Sit down. No, it's my vagina. Now, thank you, Maeve. Settle down, please. You're both wrong. It's my vagina. I knew that I wanted to tell a story about kind of revenge porn or um, like se sexting gone wrong sort of thing. Um, Cause I, I think it's very sadly like something that a lot of young people are afraid is gonna happen. And that kind of threat sort of uh, lingers. But obviously we, I wanted to do it in a kind of a sex ed way so that it felt light rather than, you know, really dark. I think I just, the, the, the image just came to me of this sort of like I Spartacus sort of moment and, and seeing kind of all the girls and also Jackson, <laughs> sort of like, sort of stand up in solidarity for each other. It is Jackson, my vagina. You don't have a vagina. You do not have a vagina in the same way that I do not have a vagina. It's my vagina. Please. It's been quite interesting because I think that's a real moment of solidarity in series one. And then in series two, we have the girls coming together to support Amy. And then in series three, we, you know, one step further and it's really like the whole school coming together to sort of support each other. And so it's a sort of recurring theme, this idea that even though we're all very different and we might not all see eye to eye like when it matters let's sort of come together and show solidarity and allyship I remember thinking I wonder if it's going to be too heightened you know it's sort of it's quite a sort of theatrical moment so yeah I don't think I really knew but then I also think it's one of those scenes that has kind of contributed to the overall tone of the show and that we can kind of get away with these kind of fantastical moments. Me Too actually happened about, I think it was about three weeks after we did our writer's room for series one. And I remember so strongly this feeling of like just the world. It almost felt like we were all in a state of psychosis. And then we woke up, like we all just went, oh, all of these things are happening to women every day and have been happening. And now we get to talk about it the conversations that women are privately having with each other, we're now able to kind of bring it out into the light. But at the same time, like we had already sort of been storylining the way that we had and my room was, you know, full of women. So I think the storylines were already quite female focused, but I don't think that people maybe would have received the show as well if it wasn't for me too. So I think both things happened at the right time, if that makes sense. What are you doing? He's working on me. Can I get off the bus, please? A few years ago, I was sexually assaulted on my local bus, and I just really felt like I wanted to write about, you know, as a writer, I guess, like, you're kind of looking for catharsis sometimes, like, you're trying to kind of get it out through your work. So I knew I wanted to write about it, but I didn't know which uh, character. And then it became quite clear to me that Amy was sort of the perfect character to explore it with. You know, when we first meet her in series one, she's just, she's sort of so open and sunny and she's a very present person. And so you can, you really get to see sort of the Amy before and then the Amy after and her world suddenly kind of closing in and, and her realizing she's not as safe as, as she thought she was. And there's just something very heartbreaking about that. So I brought the storyline into the writer's room for series two because we're, you know, we're mainly female, it very quickly became apparent that it was like, oh, like my story is your story is your story is your story. And like basically every single woman in that room had had a similar experience. So it was, yeah, very much in series two kind of working out, like building up to episode seven where we could 
really make that point and sort of go, okay, so we're very with Amy, we're following her story, and then suddenly we're like, oh, her story is everyone's story. And there was a scene that was cut out, actually, of um, episode seven, um, where she, Amy ends up talking to her mum, and then her mum also, you know, mm. has a story. It didn't, it ended up not quite working. It took the emphasis away from the solidarity and, like, the yeah. friends and the girls. But, yeah, it was very much just that feeling of, like, it's every woman that you know. And, you know, obviously it might not be as extreme as Amy's, but it will be a moment where, you know, as a woman you've been made to feel unsafe. It also felt important to me that there's no kind of fix. It's just something that now is part of who she is and it doesn't mean she's a broken person, but it is something she's going to have to carry with her and kind of learn to live with. And I wanted Jean to say that to her. Well, you may never be the old you, Amy. But that's okay. And I think by the time I got to series three, there were certain things that were happening like in the world, I guess like darker forces, more conservative forces. And I felt like we needed to acknowledge that as a show. And I, yeah, hope was really the way to do that. Good morning, morning. How is everyone feeling today? Really good. I am your new head teacher. With the shows that I love, like they kind of find a natural end unless they've been cut before their time and there are so many shows like that as well where you just think god they just needed more you know they needed more series but they, they didn't get them but yeah I think obviously with the teen element it does feel like you know you're you're working with actors who are who are getting older and also you can't kind of keep these characters 17 forever I don't feel like I'm done with them yet um but I do feel that I, I probably wouldn't want to take them to university, I don't think. I think um, I sort of, I like it being in the kind of high school world. I'll never say never, but because, <laughs> yeah, maybe in 10 years' time you'll be like, mm, <laughs> this show is, uh, they're like 60 years old now. But um, <laughs> I think keeping them in school is a good, good idea. <laughs> With writing, it is just so much about patience and just trying to get into a habit of, writing every day but also I really do think just like watching as much TV as possible like I think if you want to write TV you really have to love it you have to love the medium and and not be a snob I think you have to kind of watch everything and really kind of get to understand structure and like what structure really is and uh, I don't know like I meet so many people who you know they're literally like and obviously The Wire is an amazing show but they'll be like the Wire is the most amazing show and I, I have not watched anything else. It's like everything of that caliber. And you sort of think, well, you should be watching like the soaps as well because you need to get that kind of the structure and the idea of how to create characters sort of in your DNA. And so you have to watch everything, I think. Yeah. <laughs>